Today, we are going to be talking about how gut bugs contribute to metabolic chaos. If you are ready to dive in, drop the word gut, G-U-T, into the chat, and we are going to send you our gut bugs and metabolic chaos guide. Welcome to the Health Coach Tip Tuesday show, where every week we share tips, tools, and resources for health coaches and professionals so you can confidently solve your client's health issues and grow your career as a health coach or professional. I am your co-host and FDN Director of Course Enrollment, Piper Gibson. And as many of you know the man next to me, this is Reed Davis, founder of Functional Diagnostic Nutrition, and he is here to host with me and share his deep knowledge and expertise to help you out too. Welcome everybody, welcome Reed, how are you? How are you today, Reed? Hey, another two. Good, can you hear me? I can hear you now, we had a little glitch. Good. Okay, well, there may be a slight delay in the sound, but I hope everyone can hear and hope I have something worth listening. You always have something worth listening to. And welcome to everybody who's joining us today. We would love to know, are you working from home? Where are you joining us from? If you have any questions, absolutely drop those into the chat and Reed will get to those to today as well. So if you are ready to dig in, Reed, we are gonna talk about how gut bugs contribute to metabolic chaos. So what I would love to start with today is, what makes a good host? You're asking me, and uh, we are having a little bit of technical stuff. Uh, I see a delay mm -hmm. here in the internet connection. So uh, if you freeze up or something, I guess we'll just have to bear with it. Uh, a lot of people at home using up all the bandwidth. Right. Little rotten kids should just get to work back in school as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, I'm just kidding. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, two things. One, what is metabolic chaos? You know, like that's our one diagnosis. I'm not a physician, but I've been a health coach before they called it health coaching, you know, a holistic health practitioner, certified nutritional therapist, personal trainer, uh, massage therapist, just, just everything you could do around a wellness center, except be the doctor, which means I've really done everything. And um, when people come in the office, something's wrong with them, well, they wouldn't be there. And you can treat the symptoms. You can even run a lab and treat the paper. Sometimes people do that. My job's always been to go deeper, 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 and deeper until you uncover or get as close as possible to the underlying causal factors. Most of the time, there are multiple causal factors, not one root cause, of most of the chronic degenerative diseases and conditions that we see. So they've been going on for a long time. And there are multiple symptom clusters and uh, multiple causal factors. And our job as health coaches is to help a person straighten it out. So when we go to describe that situation, metabolic chaos is a pretty accurate construct that indicates that, you know, uh, they have symptoms, but the root causes are so far upstream, you may never find them. But you can have an effect on them if you know what steps to take. And that's the good news. We can have an effect. And so we use holistic lifestyles and protocols that have an effect on every cell, tissue, organ, and system. That way, not only we're not diagnosing a specific condition, our one diagnosis is metabolic chaos, but we're also not treating any, treating any specific condition. We're, we're just building health on a cellular level. Now, does that mean we don't want to run some labs and identify some healing opportunities? Absolutely not. We, we want to run a number of labs and look at lots of opportunities for healing. What does that person really need to, to repair, rebuild, restore, to rebalance, to uh, re-educate, to, you know, whatever it might be? To what interference do we want to remove? And some of those interferences we do like to call contributors to metabolic chaos. So what could be contributing to metabolic chaos? Well, about a million things, anything in your environment, anything from the way, uh, from your attitude, you know, things that 
bother you that cause mental emotional concern and stress anything that's happened to your body over the years mine certainly is a well-used body of old injuries that tend to you know need maintenance and um of course there's the environment and biochemical stressors chemical and all kinds of things now um when a person's been around long enough and if they have not really taken that good care of themselves, if they haven't really been up on all the function, all the things, if all they've ever done is treat symptoms and now they've landed in a place where they have uh, multiple symptoms and, you know, long list, mm -hmm. uh, they can hardly name one thing. If I say, what's the one thing you'd like to fix? They're like, well, I'm tired and, you know, can't sleep and I overweight and I, you know, you know the whole deal, right? Yes, I do. So would you ask me about yes. So that's a host who is subject to, because of, along with all the other things, they have a weakened immune system. Well, now guess what? They get bugs come along that ordinarily they could have defended themselves against, and now they can't because they're weakened in many ways. And it's not just the immune system, usually their hormones are out of balance, their digestive system isn't working, their detoxification systems aren't working either. And, and but you know, when it comes to that one specific thing, the gut, uh, we're well aware of all the uh, ways that can be in chaos and not functioning. Are there other factors that foster GI pathogens? Yeah, exposure is one thing. You know, I mean, that's why everybody's all sequestered and, and hibernating now. Um, this quarantine thing, which is killing me. You know, I, I hate it. Uh, haven't had a haircut in weeks. Oh, my God, my hair. So, um, yeah, you know, exposure is probably a big thing. Having hygiene and keeping care of yourself and, and keeping everything clean and spotless and not having dirt and filth around, you know, I mean, um, that'd be a good place to start. But um, from there, er everything else, I mean, if you're going to keep your skin nice and clean, soap and water, and and then you, you oil yourself down and whatever you do to take care of your skin real nice, you know, You've got this other skin on the inside and it's uh, the whole digestive tract, the urinary tract, you know, everything. It has this mucosal barrier. Well, it's only one layer thick, one cell layer thick, one single cell. That's all thick it is. That's not very thick. And yet it has to protect you from a lot of things, mm -hmm. bad things that come down the pipes. Now there's all the chemicals and metals, you know, just, just a lot of stuff, but it's more the, the live things, the other animals besides us, you know? So we get these dysbiotic guts, we get out of balance. And then once you're out of balance, your immune system reacts and, you know, it can get weak. It can already be weak. Again, as we were saying, doing all those other stressors and things. And then you're subject to these um, funguses and bacterias and parasites and even, dare I say, viruses. Absolutely. I like to pull out a cheesecloth and I don't have any on my desk where I would, but I like to pull it out and, you know, show it to my clients. Like in comparison to your gut, it's, you know, one cell thick, like it's very thin. And when they can kind of see that visual between the cheesecloth and what I'm telling them about, their mucosal barrier, they're like, oh, that makes sense. It's just very, very thin. Now, it's it's important to note that it's it's not just um, a physical barrier. Right. It has a chemical barrier as well that it includes these immunoglobulins, mostly secretory IgA, immunoglobulin A, and it's a secretory immune defense system that's uh, real prevalent. There, there are little cells on the, uh, on the um, villi in your gut, for instance, that produce mucus. And there's other ways that the, these immunoglobulins protect you. Um, there's other barriers in there too, uh, the enzymes and the, uh, the, the, the good bacteria even. 
and all of these things have exudates that get mixed together and pretty much you're you're pretty solid uh unless you're compromised in some way if you took antibiotics in the past um you might have upset the balance between good and bad flora well the bad flora it, it's kind of like you pull out the flowers and the weeds grow you know you're supposed to pull out the weeds and let the flowers grow um so the cheesecloth is an okay one because it is a it can be a permeable mm -hmm. and it's purposefully permeable it has to let food through food particles come through it's supposed to keep out that's why it's more of a chemical defense than a physical defense i mean it gets physical but you got to yeah. look at both angles the topography physical barrier and then the chemical barrier if you want to put it that way yeah absolutely and i do explain that too i definitely lay that out as well that it's a whole process but on that note how would somebody go about investigating pathogens whether you're a health coach or you know a professional who's working with clients how do you go about investigating pathogens <laughs> there you go test don't guess you know we don't screw around in our business we run tests you know it's like you can guess you know and i think sometimes the worst thing you can do is guess because you you know i hear this all the time it sounds like a parasite well it sounds like that to you because that's what you're you know have been exposed to and, and what education might have and, it, and you might even be right you know but we don't go by what it sounds like we because it sounds like this and sometimes you're wrong i mean it's just flat out wrong. like hey you run a test nothing you run another test still nothing then you start running, you know, as far as these pathogens goes, there's stool tests, there's blood tests, there's, there's, there's tests you could run and they're, they're good tests and they tell you a lot about a person. Uh, but you can totally strike out and be, be wrong with what you thought it might be. You know, that's why we don't run one test in FDN. I want to look at that topography in the gut. I like looking at um, a, uh, a challenge test we run for uh, intestinal permeability. It also looks at the condition of the villi themselves. Are they, are they shrunk up, you know, atrophied? Or are they shriveled up? Or, or are they maybe not shriveled up, but they're still uh, too porous, you know, or um, just what have you. You can look at uh, the gut in a lot of different ways. There's also going to your doctor and getting a biopsy. They'll pull, cut little pieces out and mm -hmm. put them under a microscope and things like that. There's, there's lots of ways to go about looking at gut. So I don't just look for bugs. We look for the damage done. The damage done is what you need to repair. Bugs you can get rid of, you know, chase them away. But it, just like in the in the part, if you're part of the expression in the ghetto, you know, if you chase out the bad people, the bums and what have you, you you're, they're, they're just going to move right back in. You're attracting the rats and the whatever other filth is in there. You know why? Because you haven't fixed up the neighborhood. You got a patch and paint, replace broken windows. You, you got to really bring in businesses, bring in things that can thrive there that will keep the place nice and tidy and neat. That way, the bums go down the street, someone else's neighborhood. <laughs> hey, I'm just kidding, folks. So, what would we see a lot of people working on themselves? You know, they read the internet maybe they're working with a professional and things just are not working. Why do you think that the typical pathogen protocols or candida cleanses fail? Well, I don't know that they fail. You know, I mean, I think people are having very good success using natural botanical products to chase down some of these uh, infections or infestations or what could just be called an overgrowth for the most part. Um, you, you can, you know, what we do is, what we say we do is we coach down those contributors to metabolic chaos. So you definitely want to enter some agents that would, um, you know, keep them from reproducing, kill them, um, you know, generally bust up the biofilms or whatever it might be that's forming there. But, you know, you can run into a couple of things. One is continuous re-exposure from someone they're with or, or, you know, some, some depends on what the bug is, I guess. And the other thing would be just so weak and intractable. These things can burrow. They can mutate as well. Once 
like yeast can mutate and plant roots and it can get really intractable. It's just, you, you, so it could take a long time. And generally people give up, you know, they too soon. And, and they're not really doing a good enough job of, of restoring that neighborhood's ecology. Like I said, if you think you're just going to kill the bugs, probably not going to happen. But if you really restore gut function, remember that topography, bring the uh, circulation back to the villi, restore the strength of the villi. Villi, those little teeny tiny uh, fingers that help you absorb food and, and are part of your immune system, they have little tiny hairs on them, the brush border. That's usually the first thing to go. And then you lose the brush border enzymes. And I can go on and on about how digestion is affected and, um, I'll spare you the details, but you know it, it really is quite an interesting environment, that, and you have to restore it all. Those villa have, um, you know, blood supply, and you've got to, and those arteries are teeny, teeny, tiny little vessels. They're just little vessels. They're not really arteries; they're they're arterial in that they're bringing fresh blood. But then there's the venous part where they're pulling out. You know, blood is returning, hopefully with some nutrients in it and not a lot of toxins. So all that can be upset. Now there's nervous system in there too, the nerves. There's also little uh, other vessels that transport the large fat molecules, you know, larger fat molecules, the, the larger lipids and things like that. So, so it's really complex, even though it's teeny and tiny. Um, and it's sensitive. And like I said, there's only one layer of cells protecting all that. And so, um, and there's, there's, um, there's little, little glands and things. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty complex and it, there's a lot of room for improvement and it takes time. I want you to talk a little bit about symptoms being far removed from the cause because you know a lot of people have symptoms going on that you know, may not really relate to what's going on. So how, how are symptoms so far removed from what's going on in the body. So let's say somebody has a gut bug. Well, you know, there's some there's some symptoms that might be closer to the cause than than uh, we say sometimes. You know, because if you if you just like you know, I was on a ship once. I woke you know just by ten o'clock at night after dinner. I just didn't even make it to bed time i was it was coming out of both ends i had virulent immediate symptoms uh that were directly related to consuming some bad poisonous stuff whatever it was you know like either i was food poisoned or i caught a serious serious pathogen some kind of bacteria and i it was coming out of both ends hard and i felt bad i felt like i was gonna die you know so there you go there's a direct causal relationship between a virulent bug and symptom but other otherwise you could have some of those similar symptoms or even the same ones for completely different reasons very far upstream and what's uh, by upstream you know you have a lot of uh, things going on you have your you have all these various stressors outside you you have all these stressors inside you and there's that concept of or construct, I like to call it, of metabolic chaos. Things just bounce around. You can be eating wrong. Eating wrong can upset carb metabolism. Carb metabolism can upset, that's, you're talking about your blood sugar now, and then, then that affects your cortisol. So then your cortisol starts going up and down, and now that affects your uh, secretory AG and your immune system. And that affects, you know, uh, dysbiosis in the gut, especially if you're taking various things and you might get a cold or flu and take some so i mean there's just so many different causal factors going on now you've weakened the gut now um you know it's trying to return to normal but if you're not uh getting the probiotics in your in your foods and or, or just taking them with supplements it, it can have a hard time reestablishing balance and that's when the bigger bugs or worse bugs more worser bugs i think that's the correct english Yes, More worser bugs could come along. I mean, <laughs> they can really kick your, they can kick your gut. They can. So, so you're saying everything's connected. Knee bone connected to the thigh bone. 
<laughs> awesome. So hello, Suzanne, Lisa, Hala. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions for Reed, make sure to drop them in the chat. We are talking about how gut bugs contribute to metabolic chaos today. So Reed, do you have any a particular um, tip or tool you would like to share as usual before we sign off for today? Yeah, I mean, um, I just, I say get outside every day and get some fresh air, man. I start usually at four in the morning. This morning I started about 4.15 as it, you know, did my bulletproof coffee. And uh, I walked around my yard for just a minute, but then I came in, I worked for probably three hours, you know, and then I went outside for an hour and I worked outside and I feel so much more able to come back and do, and do, you know, do some more work. I, well, I don't know which one is work. They're both work, but they're both enjoyable when there's balance. So I would say balance probably is the key word for today. Um, I'm clearing land and I'm burning stuff you know i had to get a fire permit and so that i could burn you know i get uh, just just so i'm doing this outside work and you know man stuff girls wouldn't be interested you know it's like chainsaws and things chainsaws can be cool <laughs> i'm just kidding. just kidding ladies yeah you know so so yeah i'm out there with my chainsaw and my rake and my and burning stuff and you know pissing off my neighbors <laughs> and uh, then I come back in and I, I kick some butt on the computer, you know, sitting here or sometimes I stand. I have a standing desk too, but, but you know, balance, balance is the key. Absolutely. We have a couple, of, we have a couple of yeah. questions for you today, Reed. Are you ready? Ma'am. Lisa wants to know if you can get vertigo from gut bugs. Uh, I've heard of crazier ideas, and I couldn't give you a direct link, but I would say that, um, you know, you can get um, vertigo from a lot of different things, and I, I'm not an expert in it. I used to do this technique. It was more of a physical thing, like in the chiropractic office. I can't remember the name of it, but um, I got pretty good at it. I was the one, you know, I was in the chiropractic office, and I did – myofascial therapy, a lot of neck stretching and trigger point therapy. We called it myofascial therapy. I'd release all these uh, trigger points and knots in people's necks. And I did TMJ work. Sometimes I'd put on the gloves and go inside. I, I did some really advanced myofascial work and before the chiropractor would see him. And I got good at this thing for vertigo where you, you put the head in these different positions. And a couple times it just went away. You know, so I don't think that had anything to do with parasites, you know, but you, you know, if you, so I haven't drawn a direct link, but nothing would surprise me when it comes to how toxins and these um, serious toxins and exudates from bugs can, can ruin a person. They can just, just go through a whole chain of whole different layers of your immune system of the inflammatory cascade, um, the, the inflammatory storm if you will you know dig heaven I, I wouldn't doubt that you could get vertigo from that um but as a direct link I, I can't i can't draw it for you right now scott wants to know if you have any tips for how to regrow villi yes scott good question and uh uh you know it takes time there's the villi and the micro villi and then there's the, you know, they live in the gut lumen inside a hollow tube, basically. So you have this tube and it's, you know, full of liquid. It's very wet in there. There's a certain pH that's going on in there. There's a lot of um, bugs in there, friendly flora. There's some not so friendly flora. Both are important. Believe it or not, you don't want zero unfriendly flora. Why is that? Well, because to keep your immune system active, and, you know, watching out for, hey, you know, enemy, you know, be, be you know, you, you got to have uh, the guards out, you know. So it's important for that villi, I mean, that environment to be really healthy. And food certainly is really critical. Don't eat foods you're sensitive to that you don't digest very well. 
and you can um, certainly knock down some of these more uh, virulent overgrowths and um, then restore normal function through, I think circulation is huge. I think it's a way underrated consideration. Obviously you want the cells to be producing uh, the mucus, the, the glands and things and, and the immunoglobulins. Keep stress to a minimum because stress raises cortisol. That tends to suppress this uh, chemical defense that you have, this immune system of the gut. So uh, absolutely you can do it. And there are uh, lots of agents I hesitate sometimes to recommend a particular product, especially brands, um, because what I noticed in 20 years is that something that worked for your neighbor right. can do three things for you. One of three things. It will do the same thing for your neighbor. Hey, it worked on me too. Well, you're lucky because the other two things are that it didn't do anything or it made you worse. So, but they're generally uh, sort of tried and true, sometimes time honored herbal things, you know, slippery elm and marshmallow root, and these things. Using um, L-glutamine has been helpful. Um, and, and, you know, certainly keeping, but a normal, like, food, you got to have vitamins, minerals, the sense of fatty acids, amino acids. You have to have your phytonutrients and your trace elements. And all these things are really, really important. You want to nourish. You know, if FDN is called functional function. It's diagnostic in nature. It's not a medical diagnosis. It's just diagnostic like you would diag run diagnostics on a computer or on a car. And it's nutrition, but it really means nurturing, nurturing, you know, nurturing every cell, tissue, organ, and system. So circulation, pretty important. Um, when I was first learning to do this, I had a DO. He liked to have his gut repair type clients or patients doing uh, like cayenne pepper just spicy food and it would get, <laughs> it brings a lot of heat, man. It brings a lot of circulation into the villi. And so there's, there's lots of sort of tried and true things. Me, so, so it's always a, a balance of removing the interferences, the contributors to chaos, metabolic chaos, and then coaching up function. How do you get normal function back and nurture mm -hmm. these areas? And, and you have to feed them and you have to rest them. And you have to exercise them. So, wow, Reed, the questions are coming in. So, Lisa, I will give you a great tip and a piece of advice is that I used to suffer greatly from vertigo. So I would recommend, one, you either find an FDN to work with who can help you look deeper at what is going on in the body. And it may be several factors that go together that are causing this metabolic chaos. Or two, take the course and work on yourself, um, which is what worked for me. I took the FDN course that definitely helped with my lifelong vertigo. So Lisa, I totally recommend check out the FDN course um, and or check out an FDN to work with for yourself. Susan wants to know if you can explain H. pylori virulence factors. Um, so she says, please explain how H. pylori virulence factors could indicate um, how intractable an H. pylori infection might be. What else might these virulence factors suggest? Can you answer this question? Yeah, you know, there's some um, questions about those. Um, there's, this, on top of the H. pylori that they're testing for, there's other uh, elements, proteins mostly in in the gut that would, um, if there's antibodies to those also, then they would call those virulence factors. Um, although some people have them, the virulence factors, even when they don't have H. pylori. So, you know, you can overanalyze the test and what you have to do is to be, and by the way, most of the time I've looked at those, um, they've been negative. So you have, you have, um, you know, H. pylori, but all the virulence factors are negative. What you have to do is go back to the person and you have to remember, we're not here to treat the paper. We're here to work with the person. And how is this H. pylori affecting them? Because some people, it, it's been said they do fine with little H. pylori. You know, like, I, I don't want to be too cavalier or casual about it. Um, it is a pathogen. It's, it's a bacteria. And it can get really bad. It can really be a 
um, primary infection, causing a lot of problems to a person, it can lead to um, other worse conditions like bleeding ulcers and, and all kinds of things. So it's a major contributor to metabolic chaos. We generally want to chase it away. That's for the beer and its factors. These are some proteins that have been shown to correlate highly with um, how sick a person might get. And um, but for me, I've run thousands and thousands of H. pylori tests without the virulence factors. And you always go back to the person and how are they doing? And what other numbers and factors do you have are probably more important. Okay. Um, one more question. Hala wants to know, is it true that an imbalanced microbiome can cause a weird taste, not acidity in the mouth when you wake up in the morning? No doubt. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things can, can cause that. And I wouldn't doubt for a minute that um, there's a lot of different reasons, including uh, the, the balance of your microbiome. Yucky. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, Susan, you're welcome about that. Um, I hope that helps you a bit, you know, the, to not overanalyze some of these labs. There's a lot of bells and whistles on a lot of them. Now, that's, by the way, DSL, or, uh, I know Dr. Tom and, and the Rep Tom, and these are friends of ours. They're, they're good to us and we're, we're good to them. We like their lab and, and we use them a lot. Um, I'm actually trying to have a meeting with Tom right now um, about having them drop a few things and save us some money or or at least add a few things that I'd like to see on the DSLGI map. I'd like to add four or five markers and have them drop about, well, at least that many and kind of see if the price balances out, you know, because there's more on that test than I need to see. And that makes it more expensive for not a whole lot of, you know, I mean, I just, you know, we just want some healing opportunities and nurture a person along and um, don't overanalyze and never, 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 ever treat the paper. It, it has to clinically correlate with the person or you're probably going to be doing no good and might be doing some harm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Reed. Once again, I think it was fantastic. We've got some amazing questions answered today. If you are watching the replay, make sure to drop the word gut into the chat and we are going to send you our guide on gut bugs and metabolic chaos. So drop the word gut into the chat. And thank you, Reed, for joining me today. And we will be back here next week, same time, same place. Thank you. And if anyone is near Lakeside and wants to give me a haircut, you can come on out. <laughs> Thanks. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.